continuing the ancient food series, in this video we will discuss about the ancient Roman cuisine. We are fortunate to have ancient texts both in Latin and Greek from scholars and cooks that help us explore the food habits and recipes of the ancient Romans. In order to talk about this subject though, we must first highlight a few key points. Roman food culture underwent significant changes over time, primarily due to the expanding power of the Republic and later the Empire. According to the ancient sources, until around the 3rd century BC, Roman cuisine was characterised by minimalism. However, as Rome's borders expanded, dietary habits began to shift due to contact with many different cultures. Moreover, the Romans gained access to new and vast agricultural lands and were introduced to new species of trees, herbs and animals. In this video, we will concentrate on the period spanning from the late Republic in the 2nd century BC to the late Empire in the 4th century AD. Our focus will primarily be on the city of Rome itself and the Italian peninsula. Nevertheless, we will also briefly discuss some of the Roman provinces. As a general rule, the Romans typically had three meals a day. The first meal was called Yentaculum and was eaten at dawn. Yentaculum was typically a light meal, usually a piece of bread dipped in undiluted wine or a piece of curd cheese with honey, olives, figs and nuts. Children typically dipped their bread in milk rather than wine. The second meal of the day, called prandium, was optional, with many Romans choosing to skip it. It was usually eaten at midday and could consist of various foods depending on individual preferences. Some favoured bread, while others preferred legumes, porridge or even cold meat and fish. This meal was typically eaten during work hours so people would either purchase their food from street vendors or have it prepared at home beforehand. The final meal of the day was called kena. Since the yentaculum was usually very light and the prandium was often skipped by many, the kena was the only full meal of the day for the Romans. This meal would be eaten at around 4 or 5 in the afternoon and could consist of anything depending on the wealth and appetite of the individual. For the extremely wealthy people though, the last meal of the day would not be the kenna. People of high status in Rome hosted conviwia, similar to the symposia in Greece where guests ate while reclining, enjoying a rich variety of food and drink and discussing various subjects. The conviwium would start late in the afternoon and on some occasions would even last until the next morning. In the countryside, cooking was done by the woman of the house. However, in Rome and other great cities, the cooks would usually be male slaves. The wealthiest Romans would acquire skilled cooks from slave markets, employing them not only as chefs but also as buyers, bakers, grinders and carvers. However, most would have one slave who fulfilled all of these roles. Cooks were highly sought after and they often became famous for their skills. Some of them, upon being freed, would take cooking as their job and would be hired by senators and emperors to cater their conviwia. The average citizen of Rome though did not have a cooking slave, either because he could not afford one or because, like most Romans, he lived in an insular, a three to four storey apartment building lacking running water, stoves or chimneys and therefore did not have a kitchen. As a result, a large part of the people in Rome did not eat at home. They had various options depending on the day and time. If they were lucky, they were invited by their patron to dine with them. For context, the patronage system in Rome was a two-way arrangement where wealthy patrons provided support to clients of lower status in exchange for loyalty and political backing, forming networks of social and political influence. The patrons often invited their clients for free meals to strengthen this relationship and would give them gifts of food to take to their homes. The other dining option for a Roman was to eat outdoors. In Rome, as well as in other great cities, there were many different types of restaurants, stores and inns. There were the taberne, small shops where one could buy snacks and drinks. 
Another type of shop one could visit was the bakery where they sold all kinds of breads and sweets. The most famous establishments though were the popine or thermopolia where customers could enjoy freshly cooked food and wine. The popina usually had a low L-shaped bar with four or five clay pots bricked into it where fresh and simple food was prepared, often including porridge, legumes and sometimes roasted meat. Customers would either eat standing or sit in chairs, depending on the size of the popina. Although mostly legal, gambling would also occur there. Some popinae would offer room services for a few people, and a few of them were infamous for hosting, let's say, less reputable activities. For wealthy Romans who preferred not to host a conwewium at home, but also didn't wish to visit the popinae, there was a more luxurious option the establishments known as Kenationes. These establishments also featured gardens and fountains and the patrons there reclined to eat. Finally, both the poor and the rich could choose to eat at the baths where they would usually sell food in the form of snacks. Over time, laws were passed which banned or restricted the preparation of certain foods due to health concerns, religious purposes or the perceived excess and extravagance of certain dishes. However, the Romans always found ways to circumvent these laws. Due to the overpopulation of the city, especially during the imperial era, many people found themselves unable to buy food outdoors. As we previously mentioned, some of these people would be taken care of by their patrons, but those who weren't had to rely on the occasional distribution of grain and meat by the emperor or the meat distributed during days of animal sacrifice in Rome. As the centuries went by, many Roman scholars and intellectuals would reminisce about the customs of their ancestors. They would talk about a time when patricians were modest in their eating habits, avoiding extravagant meals as a means of displaying their wealth, and the rural poor people and a decent living in the countryside and refrained from flocking to the cities where conditions often entailed misery and corruption. Thus, the countryside and the simpler times of the past were romanticized and seen as idyllic and true to the Roman spirit. Cereals were the principal food source of the Romans. The word cereals comes from the Latin term cerealia, which originates from Ceres, the Roman goddess of agriculture and fertility. When Rome was at the height of its power, the great breadbaskets of the empire were Sicily and North Africa, in particular Egypt. The most common types of cereal grains were spelt, wheat and barley. Other types were also cultivated, although less frequently. For example, millet was cultivated in southern Italy, while foxtail millet was cultivated in Gaul and the region of Pontus. Additionally, rye and oats were cultivated in the northern parts of the empire and were mostly consumed by the Celts and the Germanic people. Lastly, the Romans were aware of the existence of rice. However, rice was almost solely cultivated in the eastern fringes of the empire. Only the wealthiest Romans in imperial times occasionally consumed rice-based foods. The most common types of flour were from spelt and wheat. They typically preferred white or refined flour over whole grain flour, although this depended on the region and the historical period. It should be noted that spelt was usually viewed as the most ancient grain in Rome, and some traditionalist Romans only consumed spelt products, avoiding wheat or barley. Some of the most well-known foods of ancient Rome were grain-based. These included alica, made from spelt grains pounded using a wood mortar to remove their outer husks, giving them the appearance of pearls. They would whiten the pearls using various methods, most commonly rubbing them with sand or mixing them with milk or gypsum. Afterward, they washed them to remove the grit. Alica was primarily used as an ingredient in many different foods and recipes rather than consumed on its own. However, it was occasionally eaten as a standalone food, particularly by the very poor who would boil it in water. Another famous grain-based food in ancient Rome was pulse. Pulse was a porridge most commonly made from coarsely crossed spelt or wheat. However, due to its popularity, pulse was made from many other grains, including millet and barley. 
Barley pulse in particular was commonly eaten by gladiators. Sometimes it was even made out of legumes. Pulse could be eaten plain or paired with various other foods. Ancient Roman texts provided numerous recipes featuring pulse combined with milk, meat, legumes or honey. By far the most famous and important grain-based food in ancient Rome was bread. In the early years, the Romans did not have a rich bread culture. They used unleavened dough to make flatbreads which were prepared in the house over a grill. According to the writer Pliny, yeast culture was introduced to Rome during the outbreak of the Third Macedonian War in 171 BC. After that point, bread became increasingly popular. The people began cooking bread in stone or bronze ovens instead of grills and thousands of bakeries opened in Rome. During the imperial era, bread had become the most common food for the Romans, as it was for the Greeks, the Egyptians and the Persians. The Romans used many different ingredients to leaven the bread. Some used grape must, while others relied on sourdough prepared by boiling flour with water and allowing it to ferment. Alternatively, some would use a portion of the previous day's dough. Bread was made from various grains, but the people most typically ate wheat, spelt and barley bread. The dough would be mixed with various other ingredients such as salt, olive oil, animal fat, eggs, milk, cheese, grape juice, butter, herbs and spices. There were thousands of different types of breads, but here are some of the most popular. Laganum was an unleavened circular shaped bread with a thin sheet dough that was deep fried in olive oil. Panis mustachius was a ring shaped bread usually made of spelt flour and contained animal fat, cheese, aniseed, cumin and must. It was traditionally served during weddings adorned with a laurel wreath. Panis militaris was a typical bread eaten by the soldiers made from any available whole grain flour, water and salt. It was very dry, so it was soaked in water before eating. Finally, panis satipatus was a flatbread resembling the base of a pizza containing pieces of bacon and bacon fat. It is worth mentioning that breads and dough in general were also frequently used to make sweets, but we will discuss that later in the video. Legumes were the second most important mass-scale produced agricultural products. These would include broad or fava beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils and lupins. Some, like the fava beans and chickpeas, were pounded to make porridge or flour. At times, legume flour would be mixed with cereal flour. Peas were commonly included in various recipes, while lentils were typically consumed in the form of a soup. Lupin beans were given to the animals as food, but people would occasionally eat them as well. In contrast to cereals and legumes, vegetables were not mass-produced, at least not in the Italian peninsula. This is because the Romans held a great affection for vegetables and cultivated them in their gardens. Aside from the people who lived in the apartment blocks of Rome and other cities, everybody else would grow their own vegetables. In the countryside, most people would cultivate them in a small area within their farm, while wealthy people would maintain vegetable gardens in their villas. Similarly, in the city, the patricians had large gardens to cultivate their produce, while the common people who didn't live in the insulae would use small spaces, like backyards in their homes, to grow their vegetables. Horticulture and gardening were regarded as commendable practices uniquely characteristic of Roman culture. Even notable Roman emperors like Tiberius grew their own vegetables. Due to the nobleness attributed to the vegetables, gardening evolved into an art form for many patricians. They developed great proficiency in grafting, pruning and irrigation. Some even adorned their gardens with fountains, ponds and flowers. However, some cultivated vegetables not for personal consumption but rather to sell them at the market. The Romans would add vegetables into dishes or eat them raw, but they primarily consumed them in salads, which were extremely popular. A salad was typically made with vegetables, plenty of vinegar, olive oil and salt. Among the hundreds of vegetables they consumed, some of the most notable were cabbage, lettuce, onion, garlic, cauliflower, broccoli, 
sprouts, artichoke, taro, and caper. Broccoli and sprouts in particular were first domesticated and cultivated by the Romans. They also consumed wild vegetables such as mallow, mustard, parsley, and nettles. Finally, there were the mushrooms. Although today we know that mushrooms are fungi, the Romans viewed them as vegetables. While mushrooms were not widely used in Roman cuisine, they were featured in meals of the upper class, leading their cooks to possess extensive knowledge of them. In the early days of the Republic, the Romans rarely consumed meat, as livestock animals were primarily needed for agricultural work, wool production, milk and eggs. However, over time, with increasing wealth, this changed dramatically. Meat became a staple food in ancient Rome, to the extent that emperors would often distribute meat instead of grain. The most famous meat was pork, as pigs were specifically raised for consumption, unlike other livestock animals. The Romans ate nearly all parts of the pig, including the ears, cheeks, tongue, head, liver, and intestines. These were usually boiled and served as soup, but could also be eaten cold and sliced. In special occasions, they would roast a whole pig above the fire. A very famous delicacy was stuffed suckling pig. Ham and sausages, foods we frequently eat today, were common during ancient times. Sausages in particular were highly popular among the Romans, who produced many different varieties. In order to make the sausages, they used the coal fat netting of the pigs, filling them with pork or meat of other animals, along with various herbs. Additionally, they particularly enjoyed pork meatballs. Less famous meats in Rome, but widely consumed in the countryside, were lamb and goat. In the city, lamb and goat meat would be eaten either by the patricians in the convivia or on religious celebrations that included animal sacrifice. Cattle meat was less popular than the others, as oxen were crucial for agricultural tasks. The Romans primarily preferred meat from young cattle, known as veal. Occasionally, they would also eat cow beef, as cows were raised for milk rather than agricultural work. During the time of the Republic, cow beef was almost solely eaten on religious days or festivals. Many Romans also raised poultry, particularly geese and chickens, which were valued both for their meat and eggs. Many would fatten these birds before consumption. The liver of a fattened goose was considered a special delicacy, a tradition that continues today in France with a dish known as foie gras. As we mentioned, during the early days of the Republic, most Romans would only eat meat on religious holidays that included animal sacrifice. When an animal was sacrificed, a part of its entrails was wrapped in fat and was thrown into the flames of the altar as a gift to the gods. The rest of the meat would be distributed to the priests and the crowd. It would then be cooked in either the kitchens of the temple or at nearby Popine. Sacrificial meat was highly sought after because of its ritual significance. In the time of the Republic, they would usually sacrifice a single animal. However, in later times, many emperors would host festivals where hundreds of animals were sacrificed. The type of animal varied depending on the god or goddess being honoured and the specific ritual day. However, the most commonly sacrificed animals were cows, chickens, rams and pigs. Livestock meat was not the only type of meat consumed by the Romans. Wealthy individuals often maintained large fenced spaces called leporalia where they bred animals. Inside these, they primarily kept hares and deer. Many would have a space for dormice, which were nocturnal small rodents and were considered a delicacy in Rome. These animals could also be kept in enclosed spaces in the garden or even in large jars. Additionally, many would breed snails, another well-known delicacy often eaten with garlic. Some people had large aviaries in their villas, inside of which they kept many different types of birds, both wild and domesticated. Most of these birds were intended for consumption. The aviary served as a breeding ground similar to the Leporalia. Some of the most notable birds were pigeons, larks, blackbirds, figpeckers, thrushes, ostriches, and even flamingos and peacocks. 
flamingo tongue was a highly sought after delicacy for those who could afford it. Another type of meat the Romans consumed was game meat. Due to over farming and over grazing in the Italian peninsula, few natural hunting grounds had remained. So the Romans created the vivaria, large forested reserves where they hunted local or imported animals. They usually hunted wild boars, deer and rabbits. Venison and wild boar meat were particularly sought after, though rabbit meat was not highly esteemed. Some also hunted more exotic animals such as the alpine chamois and the African antelope. Additionally, the vivaria provided opportunities for bird hunting with species such as ducks, pheasants, thrushes, partridges, quails and wild chickens being among the targets. Finally, some would eat the rough meat of the animals that were killed during gladiatorial games or in the venationis, the animal hunts that took place in the circus. This meat was either reserved for the elite or distributed among the populace, and sometimes it was even sold to the markets. Animal-based products were also a major part of Roman cuisine. As we mentioned, yeast and chickens were primarily raised for their eggs. Eggs were usually boiled, baked, fried, and even cooked in ash. Quite often though, the Romans would suck the raw egg white and yolk straight from the eggshell. Eggs were typically the starting dish of the meal. Chicken or goose eggs were the most commonly consumed, but wealthier Romans would also eat the eggs of ostriches and even peacocks. The most popular egg dish was called patina, which was an omelette that could include cheese, milk, meat and even fish. Additionally, eggs were used as ingredients in thousands of different dishes and as thickeners for sauces. Dairy products were even more prevalent than eggs. Cheese was a staple in the daily diets of both wealthy and common people and was used as an ingredient in a vast array of dishes. It was primarily made from sheep, goat and cow milk. Generally, the Romans preferred sheep and goat cheese over cow cheese. However, since cows produced lots of milk, it was often mixed with sheep and goat milk. Less commonly, the Romans would also make cheese from horse, donkey, hare and rabbit milk. The most rare but highly sought after varieties were cheeses made from camel and deer milk. Cheese could be fresh, aged or firm, but those who could afford it preferred the aged variety. The Romans typically added various herbs to enhance the flavour, especially in fresh cheese. A popular delicacy in Rome was smoked cheese, which was made by exposing it to burning applewood. The most common fresh cheese was curd cheese, which was a standard feature in ancient Greek cuisine as well. It was made by placing the cheese in brine and then drying it in the sun. The Romans typically pounded curd cheese, garlic, oil, vinegar and various herbs like mint and coriander in a mortar. This mixture was called moretum and was a famous Roman paste that they would spread onto bread. The most sought after types of cheese were those made in the Alps and Apennine mountains as well as those produced in the province of Gallia, modern day France. Another dairy product that was known but was rarely eaten by the Romans was butter. It was primarily consumed by Celts and Germanic peoples within the empire who used it to make bread or as a type of fat in food preparation. The most usual butter was made from cow's milk. In the early days of Rome, fish was rarely eaten. It wasn't until after the Punic Wars and the conquest of Greece when the Romans established their presence at sea that they began consuming fish more frequently, adopting dietary habits similar to those of other Mediterranean cultures. Initially, it was the Roman elite who developed a strong appetite for seafood. Later though, this preference extended to the common people as well. Fish became a notable part of Roman cuisine, although it never reached the same level of prevalence as bread, meat or cheese. Saltwater fish was considered a luxury food and was primarily consumed by wealthy people, while freshwater fish was more commonly consumed by the general populace. Saltwater fish included anchovies, sardines, red mullet, sturgeon, parrotfish, gudgeon, tuna, 
mackerel, and even dolphin and dogfish. Meanwhile, the most typically consumed freshwater fish was carp, perch, trout, and pike. They also consumed other seafood besides fish, such as octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and jellyfish, often served sliced and with vinegar. Additionally, crustaceans like crabs, lobsters, shrimp, and prawns were commonly eaten. Finally, shellfish like sea urchins, mussels, and oysters were also part of the diet. Some of the fish or crustacean meat was used to make sausages and meatballs. Ancient Romans had a notable culinary tradition involving sauces. Garum, a fish sauce widely used in many ancient Mediterranean cuisines, was particularly famous. It was made by adding layers of fish, fish guts, herbs and salt in large jars, stacking them on top of each other and letting them ferment for two to three months. The liquid produced from this process was the garum, while the residue that remained, known as alec, was used in various recipes. There were hundreds of different types of garum, with different fish and herbs. The Romans added the sauce to everything, from salads and meat to cheeses, sauces and soups. During the time of the empire, there were hundreds of garum factories all over the Mediterranean. Garum was widely popular in Spain, Greece and Phoenicia. Each had their own different methods of production. While fishing was the predominant method for obtaining fish, the Romans also developed pisciculture. The piscina was a large fish pond or lake where wealthy Romans would breed fish for commercial purposes. Initially, this practice focused on freshwater fish, but later they also constructed piscinae for saltwater fish. However, maintaining a pool for saltwater fish was extremely costly. As a solution, many of these pools were constructed by people with seaside villas who connected their pools directly to the sea. This type of business eventually proved to be extremely profitable. The most famous and luxurious fish to breed was the electric moray eel. The Romans had a great interest in this animal, not only for its meat, but also because of its ferocious look. In addition to breeding fish, they also constructed poles for shellfish such as oysters. Olives were a staple food in many Mediterranean cultures and this was also the case in ancient Rome. According to Roman scholars, the cultivation of olive trees was introduced by the Greeks during the time of the Republic. By the 1st century BC, there were thousands of olive farms all over the empire, cultivating different varieties of olives. Black and green olives were present in the diet of both the wealthy and the common people. One of the most famous olive-based foods was a paste called epiterum. It was made by pitting and mincing olives together with herbs such as coriander, mint, cumin, fennel and rue, along with oil and vinegar. A bitterim was typically eaten with bread. Olive oil was a core element of Roman cuisine and culture. Numerous varieties of olive oil were available, each characterized by factors such as the timing of olive harvesting, the type of olive and the post-harvest processing methods. Olive oil was added in salads, breads, sauces, and meat. Aside from its culinary use, it was also used as perfume, medicine, bathing product, and most notably, as fuel for night lamps. Mediterranean herbs were also essential components of the Roman diet. The ancient Romans added herbs to nearly every food to enhance flavor, whether in bread, cheese, sauces, or meat. The herbs could be fresh, dried, or marinated in brine or vinegar. They used hundreds of different types in their foods, but some of the most notable were garlic, onion, coriander, cumin, parsley, lovage, rue, basil, mint, dill, mustard, aniseed, thyme, and oregano. They also used spices, although less frequently than herbs, as they were much more rare and predominantly used for perfumes and fragrances. Spices in food were primarily used for flavoring sauces, especially garum. Thanks to the empire's expansion in the east, they were able to obtain many spices through the Silk Road trade. 
Among these spices were long, black and white pepper, cardamom, saffron, clove, ginger, myrrh, caraway and fennel. The most expensive spices though were cinnamon and cassia. These were so exotic to the people of the Mediterranean that they gave rise to various legends. According to Herodotus, there was a belief that cinnamon and cassia could only be found in the nests of a phoenix perched atop high rocks or trees. Many Romans believed a legend that cassia grew near marshes but was guarded by great bats with claws and winged serpents. However, the writer Pliny believed that these were merely tales fabricated by merchants to spice up the prices, no pun intended. Another famous spice in Rome was silphium. Silphium is a now extinct wild plant that used to grow in Libya, specifically near the Greek city of Cyrene, which is why in Latin it was known as silphium kirinaicum. The juice or resin extracted from the root and stem of the plant, known to the Romans as Lazar or Lazarpicium, was widely utilized by Romans, Greeks and Phoenicians primarily to season their meat and fish. It was also used as an aphrodisiac and possibly for birth control. After a few centuries, the plant became exceedingly rare, with most transactions occurring on the black market, and it eventually became extinct around the 1st century AD. While the overuse by the Romans is a likely factor, ancient scholars offer different explanations for its demise. Pliny attributes its extinction to the overexpansion of farmlands by the Romans, while Strabo suggests that barbarian tribes, unaware of its significance, contributed to its destruction when they invaded the surrounding regions of Cyrene. Roman scholars and cooks refer to another variety of this plant, known as Silphium Parthicum, which grew in the Parthian Empire, particularly in the regions of Armenia, Persia and Media. However, they observed that its flavour was notably inferior to that of Silphium kirinaicum. This plant is likely associated with Asafetida, a plant which still grows in these regions. In ancient Rome, fruits were commonly enjoyed as desserts, whether fresh or dried, and their juices were used to enhance sauces and flavoured drinks. The Romans introduced numerous fruit trees to Western Europe which have since become integral to the region's food traditions. They generally consumed a wide variety of fruits. Among these were plums, dates, peaches, pomegranates, pears, apples, cherries, apricots, services, quinces, mulberries, medlars, blackberries and finally lemons which were introduced during the time of the empire. Figs were among the most famous fruits and were especially loved by wealthy Romans. The most important fruit though was the grape. The Romans acquired the knowledge of domesticating and cultivating grapevines from either the Greeks of southern Italy or the Etruscans in the north. Throughout the late Republic and the Empire, grapevines were cultivated in nearly all of Rome's territories. In addition to fields, vines flourished in villas, small city houses, gardens and backyards. These vines yielded a variety of grapes, black, white, purple, round and elongated, each unique to its province and suited for specific purposes. The Romans enjoyed grapes both fresh and dried. Most crucial however was the grape juice, a core element of Roman cuisine, economy and culture. The Romans used grape juice for three different products. One of these was wine, which we'll discuss in another video focused on ancient Roman beverages. The second one was vinegar. It was a staple of Roman cuisine, often added to various dishes, particularly salads. Additionally, it served multiple purposes beyond the kitchen, such as treating wounds and insect bites, as well as purifying water. Another significant product was must, which was derived from crushed grapes along with their skins and seeds. It did not undergo the fermentation process that produced wine or vinegar. Must had many uses in Roman cooking, being added into sauces, soups and salads, as well as serving as a leavening agent for bread and as a refreshing drink. Beyond just fleshy or true fruits, the Romans enjoyed nuts as well. They consumed chestnuts, walnuts, hazelnuts, pine nuts, almonds and pistachios. 
Larger ones such as chestnuts and hazelnuts were commonly enjoyed roasted, while smaller varieties like pistachios were often used as toppings in salads or added into various dishes served during the Kunwiwia. In ancient times, the perception of sweet foods differed significantly from what is commonly regarded as sweet today, mainly due to the absence of sugar. Although the Romans were certainly aware of sugar, and it could be found, albeit very rarely, it remained highly expensive and exotic, never becoming a preferred ingredient, not even among the Roman elite. Similar to other ancient culinary traditions, honey was the predominant ingredient in Roman sweets and desserts. The most famous was from thyme plants that grew on Mount Hemetus near Athens, although there were also numerous bee farms in the Italian peninsula as the Romans had mastered the art of beekeeping. According to the writer Columella, the best plants for producing honey were savory, thimbra, thyme, oregano and rosemary. The Romans enjoyed a variety of sweets, including dishes like cheese with honey and bread or fruits. One of the most popular sweets was the Greek dish known as placenta, featuring layers of baked dough sheets, fresh sheep cheese and honey. A very famous Roman sweet dish was the globi. These were spelt balls mixed with curd cheese, fried in lard and topped with honey and poppy seeds. As we can see, Roman cuisine was incredibly rich, drawing ingredients and foods not only from Italy but also from all the corners of the empire. From the simple meals of workers to the elaborate dishes served at the Conwiwia, Roman culinary traditions would leave a lasting impact on many different cultures, with many of their recipes still worth trying today.